back to check out the stat by your girl Treasure Wilson, aka Stat Baby. So today we talking about the Celtics versus Mavs series, Caitlin Clark's Olympic snub, and does Will Smith really owe the black community an apology? But first, I've got to give a shout out to our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. With Underdog, you can earn money by making picks on your favorite players. You can try the app in California, Texas, and New York, and the list goes on. If you want to play along, go download Underdog Fantasy, use code STAT, but match your deposit up to $100, and you get a special pick. So first, let's do our Underdog Fantasy picks of the day. So tonight, we got game four. Mavs versus Celtics. I'm not even going to get too into this because we are going to discuss this in a second. But Underdog has Luka at 32 and a half points. They want any chance at winning. I'm hoping he's going to have more than 32 points, but do I think he will? I don't know. I'm going to go lower. Underdog has Jason Tatum at seven first quarter points. Again, Jason Tatum has been an interesting factor in this series. He hasn't been putting up as many points. He's been doing more assists. So in the first quarter, I'm going to put him as lower. I think he'll have more points as we go along. And then Jalen Brown is at 34 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. I think game four, if Jason Tatum really wants to show that he's him, which he did a great job of doing that in game three, Jason Tatum's going to have a little bit more things going on. I think Jalen Brown's going to have just about 30 to 32. So I'm going to go lower. Make sure you guys download the app and you can make your picks too. So y'all know I usually do my Superwoman of the Week, but today we got things going a little bit different. Today we are joined with a special guest, which is my dog, Miles Johnson, a.k.a. Real Talk with MJ. How you doing? So, Stat. (laughs) How has your day, week been? I know you've been doing a lot of sports takes. I know things have been crazy. Before you even get into the topics, just how are you feeling about everything that has been going on this week? Um, I've been real sick. <laughs> you see what's behind me, right? Facts. It's Allen Iverson. Yep. <laughs> it's the Eagles. <laughs> I'm from Philly. I'm proud. And man, I don't like Boston at all. So I'm <laughs> sick. I've been sick all week. Facts. I had the Mavs winning in five games. Now, part of it was my hatred for the city of Boston. Yeah. I don't like them being happy at all. Yeah. But I believe in Luke and Kyrie. I know we're going to talk about that. But, hey, look, in New York right now, yeah, I'm just sick. I'm just sick. Yeah, no, I definitely felt that. And I feel like that's like a common energy for a lot of people. You either love the Celtics or you hate them. And I always have to make it clear. I am not a Celtics fan. I'm a Heat fan. I especially feel some type of way about them. But I got to be truthful and honest when I see what's going on. And we're seeing what's going on. So let's talk about it. Celtics are 3-0 in this series against the Mavs in the NBA Finals after beating the Mavs 106-99 to in Game 3 on the Mavs' home court. So let's talk about the games we've seen so far, just in general, from the jump, right? Not before from what we've seen. Did it seem like there was a clear-cut better team? I knew coming into it, the Celtics had the overall top to bottom better team. But I was wrong because I overestimated the abilities of Luka and Kyrie. Because you got to think, Luka's best games have been when Kyrie played terrible. And Kyrie's best game was arguably, well, not arguably, was Luka's worst game. Right. So it's like they never on the same accord And it's surprising that on the biggest stage they aren't because you saw against the Timberwolves what happened. 30 balls, both of them. They both had 36 in a closeout game. So that's something that I thought, you know, Kyrie and Luka, they would have been more on their game and be more cohesive together like they were in the West. And then I see a guy in Joe Missoula. He deserves an apology for me. I thought that he just had an A-plus roster. Here's what I said. I said, Joe Mazzula has an A-plus roster. He's a C-plus coach. And I look dumb saying that now Mm -hmm. because he's an elite coach, and he's thoroughly out-coached Jason Kidd. And so what I like about Mazzula, though, is that he has eliminated the the role players. Mm -hmm. He's completely eliminated all the role players 
PJ Washington has gotten some, you know, something. Derek Lively has done a little bit, but for the most part, he's eliminated the role players. And then he's like, all right, if Luka gets 30, a triple double, if Kyrie gets 35, we'll live with that because I trust Drew Holiday, Derek White. I trust the Christoph Porzingis to a lesser degree. You know, heck, even Xavier Tillman was getting three. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So the Celtics are built that, like you said, even if Jason Tatum isn't playing his best, even if Jalen Brown, I mean, he's the Finals MVP, I think by far, but even if he has a pedestrian night of like 20 points, they can still win. So top to bottom, the Celtics was definitely the better team, but I thought the Dallas superstars would play better together. Yeah, great take. I definitely think a lot of people were in denial because if you look back going into it, it's kind of crazy to even, like if we're being truthful, it's kind of crazy to even think like, oh, like the Mavs are exceptionally better because we see the players on the team great, but like the record that the Celtics have had throughout the season has been insane. And Missoula has definitely outcoached Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd had very weak defensive schemes for the Mavs to play. And then just the Celtics, the way that they've been going, the way that they've been outscoring, even just in the third quarter, game three, they've just been doing the better job. When we've seen Porzingis come back game one, how he was able to, you know, put up shots offensively in a quick amount of time first quarter. Like, they just had all the, the ingredients in the recipe that they needed to win, and they've remained consistent which is something that the Mavs have lacked. I think that they've been a lot more inconsistent because kind of like you said, you know, there's this argument for them being the best backcourt duo that we've seen in recent years. And then, like you said, Kyrie will have a weak game and then Luka will have an exception, exceptional game. For them to be on the same accord, like same way with Jason, Jason Tatum and Jason Brown. I'm not going to say that when Jason Tatum scores less points, he's having a bad game because I think he's being a great role player which is what the Celtics needed to win, as we've seen has got them this far. But to see the disparity and yep. differences between the Celtics and the Mavs and what the Celtics have been doing that the Mavs just can't seem to do, it's frustrating, especially like, like you said, like a lot of us aren't necessarily Celtics fans, which is okay. But to see them just have that recipe fixed, like this is smooth sailing for them and this is not a way to go. And I'm not going to say what I think my prediction is. We'll get to that in the end, but Seeing how things are going, seeing how the tables have turned, this is not the type of series that we expected to see. In game four, I'm stressing out for the Mavs. I think it can only go downhill from here. Okay. And yeah. then your thoughts real quick before we go to the so, next question. <laughs> he said it's over. <laughs> okay. And then just in general, who do you feel like has been the most disappointing player? There's been a lot of back and forth for both teams, different cases, but who do you believe has been? See, look, obviously, like, the superstars, they get majority of the credit, but they get majority of the blame. Luka Doncic has gotten a lot of praise. 25 years old, got his team to the finals, Western Conference Finals MVP. I mean, it looked like he was ahead of schedule because a lot of these guys, whether it's LeBron, you know, Jordan, Heck, even Tatum to a lesser degree. But like these guys have had to have, they've had their lumps in the playoffs versus like, you know, Luca. We were like, well, shoot, he might go into the finals and, you know, win his first chip early on. All that to be said, if he doesn't play well, especially in a game three, you gotta, you gotta criticize him. Yeah. And it pains me to say it. It really do. But I think two things can be true as well, though. Okay. Luca did not play well in game three. Defensively, especially. I mean, you saw, I mean, remember that Jalen Brown dunk and he just let him go straight <laughs> to the lane right. for talk about the times when he was complaining to the refs. And then Sam Hauser gets three after three because he too busy barking at the refs. And this has been a problem for Luca, But I would also say these role players. And a guy that I'm looking at, Tim Hardaway Jr. Yeah. Was out there doing cardio. <laughs> I could do what he did. I could do what he did. Just running out there. I'm like, 
And I feel bad for Jason Kidd, though. I feel bad for him a little bit because I'm like, you're an NBA player. If you're given 20 minutes in a finals game, I would hope that, like, you do something. Can I get an assist, a rebound? Can I get, you know, a block, a steal, some, some free throws? So Tim Hardaway Jr., I feel like if he, shoot, gave him a couple of threes. That's the guy who hasn't made a shot since May 18th, if I believe. May 18th is about to be June 18th, <laughs> four days. So I would just say Tim Hardaway Jr. is a guy, if you don't want to go the superstar route, I'll say him. He was disappointing. I thought that he would at least give a little bit of a spark. Right. Yeah, it kind of seems like this stage had everybody kind of frozen. And I felt like it's kind of like defrosting ice. Like everybody was frozen up. And then game three, everybody's like, oh, let's try to make some movement. Okay, we're back in Dallas. Let's see what we can do. You cannot wait till game three to start making some shake. It's just too late. That's why for me, like, and I don't like to blame Kyrie because it's like, you know, we praised, you know, what he has done in the season so far, kept quiet in his lane, doing what he needed to do. And then I loved his performance in game three, but you cannot wait till game three to start making things shake. And so that's why I feel like Kyrie is the most disappointing player in this series this far. And Luca, the thing about Luca is the, the thing that's kind of going around is that Luca has kind of been this way. People are saying that they feel like Luca has been kind of wishy-washy. We're just now seeing it on this stage because this is the stage to see it. I'm not going to go as far as to saying that yet because I, I just feel like that's a disservice to what he has done thus far. But then it's like, if he ain't got a ring, what has he done this far? Like, because that's what we're going for. So I'm a little bit back and forth. I'm just disappointed with the Mavs as a whole because at the end of the day, I wanted to see a good game. I wanted to see some good competition. It's really boring to watch a finals and we just know the way that it's going it's to go. Even the fact that if, if you have any hope for game four, it's just kind of like, we ain't trying to see what, what else y'all can boring. do. Y'all had you all this time. Back-to-back <laughs> -back finals where... You, it wasn't no competition for real. I thought this would be some resemblance of 2016. That's what I thought it was going to be. That's why I was so hyped. I was so hyped for this because I was like, all right, you got Luka, you got Kyrie. Before this series, they were called, you know, one of the best backcourts of all time. Right. They were literally called, could they be the best backcourt of all time? Kyrie Irving. Was talked about, is he the best wingman of all time? Right. I mean, we heard all of that stuff. And for these guys not to cohesively put it together is very disappointing. It's like we have another. They might, oh, look, they might win a game, but that's it. That it, That's it. And I'm not confident in that. I feel like Jalen Brown, that real alpha of that Celtics locker room, it's like, no, we want to finish them. No, did he? But they, we want to finish <laughs> them, you know, like in Dallas, in Dallas. So, hey, I'm not trying. <laughs> I ain't trying to get caught up. I already know how it go. Right. You're safe. You're safe. You're That's safe. That's what Jalen Brown probably thinking, though. Yeah. I don't know. I... It's a, it's a lot of different thoughts. I definitely didn't expect it to go this way. My last question before we move on to WNBA, just in general, which is kind of a no-brainer question, do you believe this series is over? And if you do, when did you realize the series was over? I realized this series was over when Xavier Tillman made that three <laughs> and Jason Tatum was on the bench just <laughs> cheering, super giddy up. I'm like, it was kind of like, you know, when it was Timberwolves versus the Nuggets and Rudy Gobert put up some BS. I mean, he had a <laughs> fadeaway mid-range shot. It was like, yeah, yeah. By that point, you know, it's over. Right. So that was the point that I was like, nah, the Celtics, they got it. Everybody's making their shots. And yeah, the Mavs came back, but, you know, mm, right. it's, just, it's, it's too late. So, yeah, I don't think they have a shot. But again, it is disappointing because... Let's just say Kyrie had a great game in game two. I believe they win game two. Mm -hmm. And if Luka had a better game in game three, I believe the Mavs win game three. Right. Now you're talking about going into game four. They're up two to one. 
it's way different. Yeah. But the stars ain't really show up together. And now it's now they down 0-3. So yeah. they might get a game, but might. that's pretty much it. Facts. Yeah, it's definitely a sad case. I knew immediately game one, even after watching that first quarter, I tweeted out, I was like, y'all, this is concerning because this what we're seeing right now should not be happening. Everybody's like, Stat, it's just game one. Like, relax. Like, Porzingis is just having a good game. No, like, this, <laughs> this doesn't happen. We don't see this happening, especially with the Mavs on the court. We got Luka and Kyrie. We got everybody who should be on the court trying their best. You can tell they're trying their best. It's not translating to a great score. Like, I was like, yeah, it's over. I already know this is over. And it's sad to say, not to be like, I was right, but I said it earlier in the, when the free season first started. I was like, I feel like this is the Celtics' best opportunity. This is their best chance. They have a lot more to prove because they do have a lot on the line of people, you know, comparing them to their past teams and like saying Jason Tatum's not really him. This was the perfect opportunity for them to be like, look, I'm going to shut all y'all up. We got Missoula in the cut. We finna show y'all what we're about. And that's what they did. I think later on, we're going to realize how, not saying that they're not a good team now because they are, but I think later on, we're going to realize when we look back at the stats, because throughout the season, I felt like it didn't really feel like it. Everybody was like, okay, the West is stacked. They have great players, great teams. Like somebody from them is going to come out on top. So I think it completely caught everybody by surprise to see that, okay, the Celtics are actually still maintaining and going this far. So just, just to see this, it's pretty surprising. But shout out to them. As far as game four, I'm confident to say that I think the Celtics, it's crazy to say that the Celtics are going to sweep the Mavs, but I think that that is what's going to happen. We move on. Miles, what do you think is happening in game four? And then we'll move on. <laughs> Man. <laughs> What'd you say? I said basically, do you think that the Celtics are going to sweep the Mavs or you think the Mavs gotta get a game in? No, I think I got too much <laughs> respect for Luca. Too much respect for Luca to think that he gets swept. Same with Kyrie. I mean, Kyrie, like, look, you can't get swept. Like, what happened in 2017? It was a five-game series against Golden State. Kyrie was like, I'm going to get one. So I'm going to say, you know, Kyrie and Luka, this is the game that they finally click together on one accord, and they both have great games. I think Kyrie, when he's back at home with his folks, like, you know, he feels more comfortable at home and he'll have a great scoring night. Now I feel like Luka has something to prove. He hears everybody chatting. I've heard the craziest takes about how Luca is just hardened, but he just, he white. That's why he don't get criticized. I heard the craziest ever. And I think Luca's hearing this and being like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, we might, yeah, we might lose, but I ain't finna go out like this. So I got the Mavs getting game four and we'll see what they do in game five. I, okay. It, it's over. It, it, it'll be over in game okay. five. Yeah, you're a lot more optimistic than me. I don't think they have it. I think the time for them to have it already passed at this point is like, <laughs> even if we win one, we not miss, we not win in two. So swept is what might be happening. I see it in their future. I'm so sorry to say, but at this point, I've given up. There's nothing to show me that they you, are though. going to. Yeah. Moving forward. Because Tatum right now is saying he don't care about the whole who the best player on the team. Mm -hmm. You know, Jason Kidd earlier on in the series. Some people said that he was trolling. He mm -hmm. was trying to cause dissension in the locker room. I feel like he was dead serious. He actually felt like Jalen Brown was the best player. And Jalen Brown has a great argument. I think he's the best player on the mm -hmm. team. He that alpha dog. He they lead dog. And so do you think moving forward after they win this chip, that we might have a Kobe Shaq situation mm -hmm. where the media try to put these guys together. Yeah. And then over time, maybe one of the guys is like, shoot, let me see what I can do yeah. without you. Yeah. I don't think it's ever going to go into like public beef that we are going to see. Me personally, like right now, I think the argument everybody has is that Jalen Brown is the best player on the team. But the way that Jason Tatum thinks he's real calm about it and none of them are going to make a big fuss. I, that's also why I think that they're going to win game four because I feel like this is Jason Tatum's time to shine and say, you know what, I want to have a big impact on this finals. I'm going to show y'all that I'm really him. 
you know, all the things that he quotes and like his Kobe tributes all the time. Like, I feel like this is, he's saying like, you know, I don't, I don't really care about that. Like on the media side, like, I don't really care about that. Like, we just want to win. We want to have good chemistry. Da, 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 da. Like end of the day, as a player, when you are competitive, you are a competitive NBA basketball player. You're going to do what you can to show that you are him, whether you do it in a nice way or a mean way. So I think that that's all for show. I think, you know, people are still going to have their arguments on who they think is better. The media can do what they want. But at the end of the day, I think Jason Tatum is going to try to spice some things up to show like, hey, this is, he, he's going to show, hey, this is my team. I don't <laughs> I don't care what everybody says. This is my team. But I don't think it's going to translate to where we see arguments or any problems. They're both cool, calm and collected. Sit back. Not too flashy. Not yeah. too much. I don't see it getting crazy. So, yeah, I will say they they personalities complement each other. Yeah, because you see that. Jalen Brown is more outspoken. Yeah. In the huddles, he's the more outspoken guy. You can tell, like, he the alpha. And Tatum is more, some could argue he has the game of a Batman, but the personality of a Robin. Right. So you got the personality of a Robin, but you got the game of a Batman. That's perfect. Yeah. Because with Kobe and Shaq, it was like, you got both alphas. You got both alphas. Ooh. Right. But if you got one guy who is not even in his nature to like be that alpha type of guy, like it might work. It might work. I hope there's some dissension because, you know, I need my sixes to get one before, (laughs) you know, before I get too old. (laughs) Yeah. I definitely heard you there. Okay. So in the comments, let us know what you guys think about the series so far. We're going to go to break. When we return, we're going to discuss Caitlin Clark and we're going to get into ain't no way. All them shit, yeah, we the shit. Shit all year round is money season. Every flip counts. I got rich over this bounce. Girl, ain't no sales in Gucci. We ain't looking for a discount. No, no. My man Sin City say it's only money. It's only money. Ain't no sales in Gucci, baby. It's only money. It's only money. Why you acting funny? Yeah, it's only money. Welcome back. Now we're going to get into Ain't No Way, where we talk about the crazy things that happened this week. So Ain't No Way, Caitlin Clark was left off the Olympic women's basketball roster. So backstory, Team USA announced its basketball roster, and the list does not include Caitlin Clark. When explaining their reasoning, they said it would be irresponsible for us to talk about her in a way other than how she would impact the play of the team. Because it wasn't the purview of our committee to decide how many people would watch or how many people would root for the U.S., it was our purview to create the best team we could. So, with that being said, me and Miles are going to discuss our thoughts on her not being on the team. Miles, guess first. What are your thoughts? (laughs) Man. So, let me preface this by... I've been in media for, like, several years now. So, the way that I think is what's going to generate the most eyes. And obviously the talk is about Kalen being a snub. I definitely feel like Team USA should have added her on. But there's something that nobody is really talking about, though. Okay. Why didn't the WM... Oh, I'm sorry. Why didn't Team USA take this prime opportunity to not only put Kalen Clark on there, but to put Angel Reese on there. Because you want to know the storylines from rivals in college to now teammates on Team USA? They would literally be a top three storyline in the Olympics. A top three storyline when you got Shakari Richardson. A top three storyline when you got the Avengers assembling with Team USA on the men's side. A top storyline with Gabby Thomas and Sydney McLaughlin, Noah Lyles, and you know Katie Ledecky. That this would be a top three storyline if they came in. And you talk about a report came out that the WNBA is going to lose roughly fifty million dollars. I don't know about you, but if I have a business that's losing fifty million dollars. I might be doing something wrong and maybe I should change it up. Now, this is no disrespect to the women that have made this team. But if you're talking about sacrificing 
either one one person or two in the case that you bring in Angel Reese as well. It's like it might be a sacrifice so that you know a girl from Italy is looking at them and being like, "Shoot, I want to play in the WNBA one day." And you have that going on and you globalize the game more. And over time, it will pay dividends by WNBA players making more money and the league being better. So that's how I look at it. And I also I'm I'm uh working the Olympics on social media. Fire. So I was pissed off. <laughs> I was pissed off. I'm like, but again, it makes your job harder in media. It makes our job harder to be like, all right, we gotta work harder to come with better storylines, you know, or to make engaging content. So I'll say that, but I would have definitely liked to see Kaylin Clark and Angel Reese be on Team USA. That would have been box office. Okay. Well, when I think about that, um, I think seeing... (laughs) You see how I started that real nice? Okay, I think seeing Caitlin Clark on Team USA would have been dope, okay? She's an athlete that a lot of people want to watch. But respectfully so, compared to the other women on the roster... It ain't going to be that much fun of a watch because she ain't going to get that much minutes. Let's just be for real. Like compared to the roster, the roster is stacked. A lot of them already have previous Olympic experience. And the ones that don't either have one of the best records in the league right now or like UNESCO, who this is her first Olympics. She literally just did the three-point shootout with Steph Curry. Like she's already breaking boundaries that we haven't seen. As far as storylines, I personally have to disagree because I don't think that Team USA is really – focused on making a storyline. I think the Olympics is going to get viewership regardless because we're not talking about things going on in the States and the Americas. We're talking about things on a global scale. I mean, if you want to see a storyline, this is why we're advocating and pushing for people to tap more into WNBA and watching the game because the storyline right here is saying, okay, we got Camillo who played for South Carolina Gamecocks under Don Staley. And we got Angel Reese who played for LSU under Kim Mulkey. They're on the same team as Chicago Sky. So if you want to see some drama, see how they coexist together on the same team for the sky. And they already got a lot going on. Third thing I'm going to add, I understand profiting and making money. And we want these players to, you know, make more money, put them on a global scale. We are already finding out ways for these women to make more money internally. So Brianna Stewart just made her own pro women's league that's starting in Miami in the fall. And WNBA players are going to get paid directly from other brands and investors. So we're already seeing a lot of it come up. And I'm not going to say that this isn't happening because of Caitlin Clark, because obviously a lot of people are now tapping to the W, but because of her, you know, bringing this kind of attention and energy to the league, other players have been able to thrive. And I think that is okay for them to thrive without fully being connected to Caitlin Clark each time they do something different. So I understand the argument, okay, we want USA to profit. We want to see Caitlin Clark on the team. But truthfully, I think Shadi just need to rest up a little bit. This will be a great little break for her because her name is not even being used in basketball discussions solely. It's being used in political conversations. It's being used in racial conversations. Like, we've taken something that as simple as just playing basketball and made it a completely different topic when it doesn't need to be. And truthfully... I, maybe I'm just biased because it's USA, but the women are going to win, in my opinion, regardless. The team is great. They're good at what they do. And if you are new and now tapped into the W, they're already going to have a lot more viewership because we already have way more viewers than we did before now that more people are tuning into the W. Like, there are some people, okay, cool, Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese or maybe even Cameron Brink introduced them. But by watching them, now they are tapping in and watching other players. It does take one player to get you interested you know, in an organization, but that doesn't mean like, oh, and like, if I'm going to swap it, bad example, but I think it's a good example. I'm not going to be like, oh, if this person's not on the team, I'm not going to watch. Like, I'm still going to watch because now I'm a WNBA fan. I'm a women's basketball fan, just like on the men's side. If I'm a, you know, NBA fan and I like watching LeBron just because LeBron's not there, if there's a Steph or somebody else there who is just as good, I'm going to watch because I like to watch basketball. So that's kind of my argument for that. I understand your point. But I do feel like it's the Olympics. It's global regardless. They've been doing well regardless. I don't really think that they're going to be lacking yeah. too much by not having her on there. That's, but that's my opinion. <laughs> it's, a, it's a multiple. It's multiple layers with it. 
Okay. Because like we can definitely, you know, agree or disagree with having her on there. But the discourse about Kaylin and Angel as well, especially in media, it's like, I'll have a video where I praise Kaylin. I ain't never crap on Angel. I'm praising Kaylin. What do I see in the comments? Oh, Uncle Rufus, oh, he hate <laughs> black women. I'm like, dang, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I can't I can't say she nice. I can't say I like some three pointers. And Angel Reese doing her thing too. But it's like it's it's like a weird thing that like if you praise one, that means oh, you don't like the other. Right. And it's like, I know they asked Kaylin a question like this week about the discourse and yes. how certain narratives are being pushed from her name. And it's like a certain point. Can we can we can we just talk about hoops? Right. It's actually a debate right now. I think of who is the rookie of the year. Yeah, and Angel has a good case. People with people have been saying Cam Brink because of her defensive prowess. Mm-hmm. I would still say Kaylin, but it's a debate, and it's a debate about hoops. Just like how there's debates on you know who's the best player on the Celtics. Yeah, debates on is Luca still a a top three player is his defense detrimental, you know, beyond repair, stuff like that, that in all other sports, you know, we have, you know, that type of discourse. That's right. what it's about. Like, and so you got that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to actually, I, I still am excited to see uh, team USA because I'm excited to see how they react with like this new spotlight, because regardless of, Kaylin being there or not, there's going to be more eyes because I think it's, it's going to be people watching Team USA and being like, well, they better not lose now. Right. Oh, man. Because if they was to lose yeah, and you didn't bring Kaylin, so it's going to be, you know, yeah, people that's watching them to be like, all right, they better not lose now. Right. They better not, not lose now. Uh, but I think regardless if they had Kaylin on there or not, they would have won. They won seven straight gold medals. They're the elite of the elite, but we'll go ahead and see. But it's so many other sports too. Like, yeah, I mean, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a ball. Yeah, I definitely agree with that part as well. But I just know for Caitlin, it's just got to be so frustrating because I can't imagine like just because like you're the best on the collegiate level and then you finally take your next steps and like you said, the discourse that has came about from all this. That's just got to be so aggravating. Like, she, like, I don't know, you know, her personal thoughts, feelings, this is what I'm saying, but I know that girl did not sign up to be an activist, and I know you get thrown into things when you reach a certain celebrity and do and have a certain position, but she did not sign up for all of that. And kind of like you said, if you compliment one player, that does not mean you're dissing one player. I find myself, you know, speaking up for Angel Reese a lot, and when I speak up for Angel Reese, people automatically think I hate Caitlin Clark and I don't want to see her win. I never said that. I just know that the things that Angel Reese is going through, even just as far as terminology, right? Like something that triggers me like so much. I hate when people use the term classless with her because nothing that she has done has given me classless. And I do feel like that's a term that people use against, you know, specifically black women a lot where they just want to say like you're acting ghetto. And it's like, she's not acting ghetto. She's just acting herself. And if you weren't raised that way, that's okay. But she was... What she did is how she feels. She's allowed to communicate her emotions. Same way Caitlin Clark is allowed to communicate her emotions, but she's not being called different things for that. And I just don't like that disparity of it. But just because, you know, I speak up for one person, that doesn't mean I'm dissing the other person. Because the other person, I stick up for her a lot too. Like when people talk bad about Caitlin Clark, I'm like, she did not sign up for this. This girl just wanted to play ball. If we went back to just looking at the stats and their games, the conversations would be a lot different. But people are using it as like a race war. It's just gotten way out of, you know, especially if you're not even prepped for that. Like, I can't imagine getting out of school, right, going straight to get drafted. Then they go straight into camp, and then they go straight to the center stage. Completely everything is changing, and then boom, hey, the Olympics are here. Like, that's a lot to even wrap your head around. Like, what? Like, (laughs) that's a lot. (laughs) That's a lot. So I feel for both of them, all the rookies. Cameron Brink has gotten in a lot easier. She's very favorable. And in addition, like a lot of men are attracted to her. So she's had a lot smoother of a ride compared to, honestly, Caitlin Clark in both Angel Reese. So 
I'm just hoping all of them are just taking the yeah. breaks they need <laughs> and just breathing. Like, I think it's good they're not part of I this. Respect, <laughs> I respect Angel that she plays into the villain role. Yeah. And you always need a villain. Like, when she made that tweet about, uh, and it wasn't just one person that, you know. She said, it's me out too. Stadiums, yeah. Filled out arenas, you know. And, you know, a lot of people will, will take it as, oh, she's jealous of Caitlyn. Right. I don't think it was that. But sometimes, too, in sports, I mean, there's some people that get in the comments. They bound to hate and say some. But guess what? You boost an engagement. Facts. You know, the same people that is under um, every Angel Reese post trying to say, well, she... Get so many rebounds because she misses so many shots. All right, cool. Like you helping the engagement, you're right. really helping the sport. Right. So all of the trolling, all of the hating, while it is weird and it is distasteful, ultimately that type of discourse is going to propel the league. And I like to just think about it. What was the discourse like before social media and all this with Magic Johnson and Larry Bird? In the 80s, it was wicked. It had to have been wicked. It had, like, back then, I feel like it's just, it's social media now, and things get blown up out of proportions, but if it was, like, a Magic Johnson, Larry Bird situation right now, oh, my gosh. I mean, that would would have been a whole other level. So, yeah, we're just getting a little bit taste of maybe what our parents, uh, that that, that, that type of discourse they was going through when they was, you know... Our age and all that stuff right. from a little bit younger. But on a good note, the game is growing, which is great. There's a lot more viewership, and we're talking about it here, which is what more people need to do, which is great. Okay. So unfortunately, that is all the time to ha- the time that we have for today. We were gonna discuss, you know, Will Smith, but we'll get into that for next week's episode. Miles, thank you for being here and joining the show. It's always a pleasure to have you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Been a pleasure being on. Uh, yeah, y'all can follow me real talk with MJ, all social media platforms, and yeah, it was great to chop it up. I gotta have you on my podcast again, Steph. We gotta talk some hoops. Let me know. We gotta talk, some hoops. We gotta talk about how your Steelers. I think my <laughs> Eagles, but finna play y'all. We finna cook y'all. But we'll chat. I hope Justin Fields is y'all quarterback. We'll chat. I hope he is. I'm still undeciding on that. I don't know, like Russell. Russell, I'm having faith in him, but Justin Fields, I'm not backing away from him. I think that he's going to make a lot of good contributions for us, so we'll see. But I'm excited for this season, so we can talk any day, whenever you're ready. (laughs) I'm going to hit you. Bet. Okay. Thanks again, Miles. But that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you all for watching. And make sure y'all hashtag check out the stat. We can continue discussion next week, and I'll see y'all.